Okay. Welcome, everybody, uh, to USA and to one of the first forums of this great uh, of this great uh, forum for everybody here today. So, so welcome again to the Army's 66th annual meeting and exposition. I'm Howard Bromberg, and I will serve as your moderator for this next session. And our forum is titled uh, "Diversity and Inclusion: The Time Is Now," and it's one of uh, eight AUSA contemporary military forums that will be conducted over the next few days. As AUSA continues to amplify the U.S. Army and helps further the association's missions to be the voice of the Army and support the soldier. We have a great panel uh, set up for you today, and each panel member, as normal panels would be, just like if we were in person, each panel member will be allocated uh, five minutes uh, to give some opening comments, and we'll have some time for Q&A. This is a little different since we're doing it on the uh, on the web as we in the first time going. I want to compliment uh, all the participants as well as the IT support for being able to pull this together because I know it's not an a easy thing. So what we want to do today before we get into the participants, and I'm going to dispense with normal reading uh, discussing the bios. I think you can see the slide in front of you now, and I think most most of you on the call are very familiar with who these great uh, leaders are for our Army. So in the, in the interest of time, since we have about 45 minutes today, I want to go ahead and focus on having their op uh, the opportunity for the panelists to uh, get their messages out. Uh, so first of all, we'd like to start uh, with the video by the Secretary of the Army, Honorable Ryan McCarthy, to share with everybody, and then we'll move straight into the paneling, open uh, the remarks by the panelists. Okay, if we could go ahead and run that video, please. Welcome to the Diversity Inclusion Panel. In my humble opinion, weighed against the work done this year and events occurring this week, this panel in particular is one of the most consequential items. The Army is representative of the nation because it's built from every corner of the nation. Our diversity is a strength and paramount in maintaining the trust of the American people. This week, we announced that we are making people our number one priority. The events of this past year has caused a reckoning within the Army as well. We must understand the barriers that our service members endure and create the conditions that every person can realize their potential. We need to listen, learn, and act. We must have accountability and make bold decisions, enabling enduring change. We need your help in enabling the Army to evolve and continue safeguarding the nation for another 245 years. These tough conversations are vital. Thanks for all you do. Okay, uh, given that the uh, introduction by the Secretary of the Army, we'll move over to uh, our first panel speaker today. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is terrific that uh, this panel in particular gets to kick off uh, AUSA this year. Uh, borrowing from the remarks of the Secretary, this is an extremely important topic, and you can see that in the panel we've assembled. Uh, I work with General Funk on a daily basis, uh, Ms. Burton, who looks after our surveying workforce, Mr. Beach, who looks after equity and inclusion matters, and General Williams, who helps build our officer corps at West Point. Uh, all these great leaders have a uh, very central focus on this topic. I've met with them uh, repeatedly throughout the year. And uh, today we'd like to share a little bit about where we've come from, uh, what we've achieved in this year, and where we're headed. Uh, if you go back about a year, uh, last uh, October, we talked about the Army People's Strategy, which had just been signed by the Secretary and the Chief. Uh, if you delve in that 14-page document, you'll find very early on uh, that the Army's strategy for how it will make uh, people its number one focus really uh, hinges on two uh, key ideas. One is culture, and that's General Funk's domain. He's uh, the gentleman leading our efforts with regard to building a strong culture, and he does that from the time uh, we recruit somebody to their time as a cadet perhaps at ROTC, on into initial military training, and then through uh, thought pieces that guide our thinking on culture throughout a career. Uh, his work pertains to the military force, as well as the civilian force. Uh, you'll hear from Carol Burton, who is gonna to talk to us about things that have been accomplished in the civilian workforce area to help build strong, diverse teams, uh, in particular focused on two things, uh, acquiring talent and getting out very quickly to compete for strong, diverse talent in your, our country. And secondly, to build strong leaders and strong supervisors through very deliberate, purposeful, and well-resourced development strategies. Uh, at West Point, 
General Williams. I'm sure will share with us his thoughts on this important topic as he plays a key role in building tomorrow's leaders. Uh, his graduates uh, from West Point go off to lead in every part of the Army. Uh, traditionally, they've been very heavily um, uh, branched into combat arms. Uh, but thanks to his efforts and other leaders, the Army has moved into a very new direction, talent-based branching, which helps us move beyond the big aggregates we used to think about with regard to officer corps, things like branch, things like grade, uh, perhaps gender, uh, perhaps race, uh, to very detailed knowledge of our officers and their talents at the outset, those talents are arrayed against 20 different areas and branches look at cadets in these areas to figure out who ought to be in their branch and they market to these cadets at West Point ROTC uh, so the cadets can understand where they'll fit in the Army. The goal here is to get diverse talent across our officer corps and to align people's preferences and their gifts with the needs of the Army so we have the right leader at the right place at the right time. Uh, Mr. Beach is going to talk a little bit about how we move beyond the big aggregates and things that are visual to things that are much more important that focus on value, what people bring to the table, how we can reach into our diverse formations and elevate the individual and have them reach their maximum potential in the Army so the Army can reach its maximum potential in service of the country. Uh, each of these leaders uh, has played a key role in building our strategy, and more importantly, they now take a key role in leading us into implementation. Uh, this summer, we completed work on our military implementa implementation plan for both the uh, civilian workforce and most recently for the military folks. These plans talk in detail about specific things we plan to do to build strong, diverse teams of talent across the Army, both within our civilian ranks and our military ranks. And they get so granular as, for example, in our officer corps area, we have 20 different tasks we're focused on to build diversity uh, today in our mid-grade ranks and at the top of the Army. So anyone in the Army can aspire to fill any role that their talents will allow them to fulfill. Uh, so with that overview, I thought I might uh, uh, move on and we can now hear from our next panelist to learn in detail about what they're working on in their area. Who's there? Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Funk, and I'm an American soldier. Uh, Dr. Wardensky, thanks again for uh, including me on your panel today on the diversity panel. And uh, it's always great to see Howard Bromberg. Howard, thanks for what you're doing and, and leading us here today. Uh, so listen, uh, Dr. Wardensky did a great uh, cover. What my job is in the Army is to run training and doctrine command, but uh, which also allows us to be in, ch in charge of or develop the character and culture of our great army. We do that through a series of uh, uh, things. We have 622, which is our leadership doctrine. Uh, we have FM uh, 722, which is our extra physical fitness doctrine, but it also goes to our holistic health and fitness programs. Uh, you know, the profession itself is uh, where we're starting from. We want to start a series and have started a series of leader development forums and webinars uh, as we reconnect with the Army as a profession. Uh, we're also going to do that in terms of training and doctrine command. We've done a, a webinar series on diversity and inclusion. Uh, and that'll start, uh, uh, Major uh, Dan Hendricks and I kicked that off uh, last week. And uh, next week we'll have uh, General, Lieutenant General Retired Tom Plastic as our first uh, speaker in terms of that program. And what we want to want to get back to is understanding what, what our Army is, understanding the diversity is our strength, as uh, Dr. Wardinsky talked about. And our program is all oriented around the professional military education that uh, has made us the most uh, doctrinally relevant and uh, professional organization in the world in terms of uh, culture and uh, diversity. Uh, so what we're, what we're gonna implement through PME this year is we're gonna re recognize potential discrimination and harassment, demonstrating empathy, understanding what our soldiers bring to fight by their diverse nature. Uh, we're gonna become uh, socially aware and what that means is we're gonna have to develop sequential training at all levels uh, so that it is interactive and it's, just, uh, it's not um, 
PowerPoint slides. It's interactive discussions at the root of our lab, root of our programs to build inclusive environments and to uh, create more cohesive teams. The, the uh, General McConville always talks about we want to be fit, we want to be disciplined, and we want to be uh, teams that are focused, cohesive teams that are focused on bringing uh, the Army's solutions to what it is we're going to do. Also along this year, we'll, we'll develop a hip target training guide on diversity and inclusion, which will be out uh, before mid-year. Uh, it'll require, uh, in that we'll talk about uh, topics such as racism, inclusion, and cohesive teams. Uh, the, our message to the forces, capitalize on our diversity, understand the differences make us stronger, and understand that we are, in fact, a profession of arms. Warriors focused on what it means to serve and be selfless servants in our great, uh, to our great nation. Uh, with that, I'll pass it to the next speaker. Thanks for your time. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it for your comments today and participation. Over our next panelist, Mr. Beach, sir, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, let me just say it's great to be a part of EOSA 2020. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to echo Dr. Wardinsky's comments to really talk about the Army's way ahead in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, we have always talked about diversity in a very one-dimensional way. And for us in the United States Army, um, you will hear from the previous comments that what we are really focused on is shifting uh, from this visual kind of construct to more of a value construct of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, in the next few minutes, I really want to uh, take you through uh, three big initiatives that we are moving through. Um, I, I want to also state that um, the Army's work on diversity, equity, inclusion is, is, is something that we are continuing and is something that we have not just uh, now started. Um, so the first one is, um, the, is the implementation of project inclusion. Project inclusion is really an umbrella term to mobilize the entire uh, department towards diversity, equity, and inclusion in states. Um, project inclusion uh, really um, has several aspects, uh, aspects to it. Uh, first and foremost, um, on the grounding is within the Army People's Strategy with the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion annex to the Army People's Strategy. This is, the strat this is the aspect of it that really integrates diversity, equity, and inclusion into the Army people business and into the Army mission and into the mission sets of the United States Army. So uh, the, the annex really has uh, five goals, 25 objectives, and really is an acknowledgement of the, of the action that the Army has taken to ensure that we have an environment that's focused on equity, inclusion, dignity, and respect. And so um, as a foundation, the Secretary of the Army really wanted to ground this and, and establish project inclusion. Uh, so within project inclusion, you would see that we have, uh, by the end of the uh, calendar year, we want to reconstitute the Army Diversity Council. We are going to publish um, some uh, plans, uh, outreach plans, focusing on uh, HBCUs and minority-serving institutions. Uh, number two is the um, on, on the annex, I want to let you know that the annex really is a replacement of the um, 2011 Army Diversity uh, Roadmap, and it also meets the requirement for Section 29 of uh, FY20 uh, NDAA. Um, lastly, is um, what the Secretary alluded to is, is listening. We have now embarked on an Army-wide Your Voice Matters uh, listening uh, campaign. And so that is where we are going across the entire Army to engage with our over 1.4 million uh, military and civilian personnel to, uh, to hear from them, to hear how current events are actually impacting readiness, and then to take those, um, um, those themes that we get back from them and, and analyze them at a macro level and at a micro level to see what has to be done policy-wise and what has to be done at a local installation level so that we can ensure that our soldiers and, and, and civilians um, have the tools that they need so that we can maintain uh, readiness. So again, I um, 
We have just completed sessions at uh, Redstone Arsenal, Fort Bragg, and the National Capital Region, and we have a full schedule um, into fiscal year 2022 where we are going to be engaging across the Army. So again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Sir, thank you for your comments. Appreciate it uh, very much. So if we could go on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Burton, please. Ma'am, can't hear you. Testing. Good morning, everyone. Again, <laughs> I'm Carol Burton, and I'm the director of the Civilian Human Resource Agency, or CHARA. And today, I'm going to talk to you about CHARA and how we support diversity and inclusion. First, a little bit about CHARA and what we do. In many cases, CHARA is the first and the last touch point in a civilian's career. Our mission is people-driven from onboarding to retirement. We're responsible for the Army's operational civilian HR processes, and talent management is one of our primary tasks. In the area of recruitment, we issue vacancy announcements, and we determine qualifications. So, for example, we'll look at a resume to determine if someone has the skills to be an engineer, a painter, or a mechanic. We issue a list of those qualified candidates to selecting officials, we make job offers and we onboard. Additionally, we collaborate with hiring officials and we advise on recruitment strategy and career progression. In fact, later this week, I have a meeting with a group to talk about how we build our civilian data scientist workforce. And finally, we have a world-class benefits and retirement processing center, the Army Benefit Center Civilian, located at beautiful Fort Riley, Kansas. Everything we do is focused on supporting the civilians, the Army people strategy, and how the Army acquires, develops, employs, and retains our people. In support of the Army people strategy effort to develop an enterprise talent management process, this July, the Army directed the realignment of career programs to CHARA, and that task was completed a couple weeks ago on 1 October. Army career programs are really important to civilians because they provide a wide variety of functions, including strategic human capital management, training and development, and enabling a pipeline of diverse, talented, and well-trained future leaders. In four short months, we've realigned the manpower and money from 32 career programs to CHARA and established the brand new Army Civilian Career Management Activity, or ACMA. ACMA integrates talent management by having all the career programs under one umbrella. And we've grouped those 32 career programs into 11 focused career fields to enable civilians to obtain experience across broader functional areas. For example, under the logistics career field, you'll not, you will now find supply, transportation, and, and material maintenance management, to name a few. And now that we have the career programs assigned to ACMA, we can better analyze the diversity in the career fields. Military personnel, the full performance level for that occupation is a GS-9. And that occupational specialty has more minorities than civilian personnel. Yet the civilian personnel occupation full performance level is a GS-11. So with ACMA, we can offer career broadening opportunities for those military personnel careerists in related occupations that might have more promotion potential into areas such as civilian personnel or even manpower and comptroller. Our end game, we are changing the culture and building multifunctional leaders of the future. And this is how we're going to get there. The Army People Strategy and an enterprise approach to talent management, a clear career path and career broadening opportunities. People are our greatest asset and diversity is our strength. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Okay, we can move into uh, our final panelists before we go into questions and answers. General Williams from uh, Houston, please. Thanks, General Bromberg, and uh, thank uh, General Hammond AUSA for this opportunity. Also to my fellow uh, medal major, Dr. Gordensky, thank you, sir, uh, Mr. Beach, Mrs. Burton. 
Here at West Point, our vision is that uh, we are the preeminent leader development institute in the world. And uh, we have to earn that today, especially in this COVID environment that we're all dealing with. Our mission is to try and inspire with confidence that each graduate, commission leader of care, committed to the value of honor, country, and prepared for a career of professional excellence and service to the nation as an officer in the United States Army. Our mission also is to be readiness by developing leaders of character who will fight and win. Our mission is nested in the Army's people first, and winning matters. Philosophy. As we all know, people are the enemy's greatest strength. We went through people, specifically through teams, as General Fong talked about. We win by doing the right, thing, the right way. And I will tell you, since I've been in 2018, building diverse and effective winning teams has been one of my strategic priorities to come and sue. And these aren't mutually exclusive constructs, the worst of you and winning. From the Army's vision, Army's long-term success depends on developing smart, innovative leaders of character who bring a wide range of skills and experiences to our ranks. Winning teams are winners. We at West Point are aligned with the Army's This Is My Squad initiative, focusing on the squad that promotes cohesion. We think best here at West Point. The goal is that all of the team feel a part of it, not just on the team. By creating a sense of where we look out for each other, hold each other accountable, these we think are the foundations of building trust in our formations. Our efforts to build the winning team focus on building trust and cohesion while identifying and eliminating trust breaking behaviors, sexual assault, rap, racism, and racial injustice. Aligned with the Army's inclusion initiative, working very hard to ensure that our cadets live above the common of life. Ultimately, this is all about character and ensuring a culture of character growth existing in our companies that enables this to take place. USMA has the opportunity to be the gold standard in this arena, showing the nation what is possible for people from diverse backgrounds unite and aspire to live honorably, regardless of race, gender. We are bound together by the Values, not your profession, not oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Thank you, and as always, thanks. Thanks for those comments. It's great, uh, great to see you, and great to hear the progress at USMA. Thanks very much. So now we're going to go into a Q and A session here uh, for the moments we have left. Um, so the first question, if I could throw out to the uh, both to Miss Burton and to General Funk, please, um, and it has to do with how do we see the the impact of COVID in our ability to just not only launch this program and make the great progress you've talked about, but are we seeing other changes on how we're going to have to uh, enable the workforce during the during a, a, the lessons of COVID? So Miss Burton, the General Funk, and if somebody else wants to. Uh, wants to add on that, that's fine as well. So I would respond by saying we're here, and I think that's a major accomplishment. Uh, for the civilian workforce, it's incredible. It took us about two seconds to figure out how to operate in a different type of environment. We certainly support or appreciate the support that we received from our automators and the folks that put the automation in place. But from a civilian perspective, we're seeing, by and large, very little impact to our operational op tempo and how we deliver services. So from the civilian side, we're good. We had to make some adjustments, but you know, we're the Army. We figured it out quickly. Over. Thank you. Yeah, just to capitalize on that, uh, that theme right there, we're the Army, we figured it out. Uh, you know, we paused for about two weeks to, uh, to set the conditions to, uh, uh, to br uh, bringing new people in. We continued to train. And frankly, this has uh, allowed us to focus on this is our squads. It's it allowed us to take the hats off for the drill sergeants and really have uh, inter uh, interpersonal communications and uh, really uh, deep 
conversations at the small unit level with our drill sergeants and the trainees. On, on the other side of this, we were able to continue the entire training and education program because we had done, uh, we had been uh, forward thinking in terms of distance learning for some time out across the whole enterprise. Uh, as a matter of fact, they flipped the switch toward um, Leavenworth. Uh, so one day they, they were going to in class. The next day, because they'd had, had the foresight to build um, classroom, digital classrooms, they were able to just transition into the digital course. This year, we've actually rewritten six, over 600 courses uh, to be able to continue to deliver the training, the quality training that the Army expects us to have um, across the course. And so we've been able to do that in, in, in contact with this disease and continue the mission. So while we paused for to bring new people in for a couple of weeks, and we've really taken advantage of changing the culture of how we're delivering the content and uh, and how we're actually interacting with ourselves. So I'll pause there to see if anybody else in the panel has got a, an answer. And so I'd probably uh, amplify uh, uh, two items, one that Carol brought up and one that uh, General Funk brought up. Uh, we had planned this year uh, in Carol's area uh, to launch our implementation plan uh, to the people's strategy, and its uh, main effort is acquire talent. And Carol's team uh, in the spring began launching that main line of effort uh, with the key idea in mind of we're in a very tough competition for talent, uh, and particularly diverse talent. Uh, folks in our country had an uh, opportunity to work in many, many different places, and our time to hire was just too long. It was about 84 days as of uh, spring and uh, as they began implementing, of course, COVID came along in March and April, and that didn't cause Carol and the Chara team to miss a beat. Uh, they had focused on how they were going to bring down time to hire with direct hire authorities, with hiring boards, with guidance to the field, um, and support to the field. And over the summer, uh, from March till about July, uh, Carol and her team brought down the time to hire by about 12%, from about 84 days down to 75 days, and they continue to improve on that. So uh, number one effort in terms of building a diverse, talented workforce is bringing in folks in the civilian side. Uh, we bring in a lot of uh, people into our STEM fields. Uh, Carol's team has worked very closely with Mr. Beach and others uh, to reach out into conferences such as BEA uh, to induce uh, folks there to think about the Army. And we've done very well with bringing in uh, diverse populations of new engineers to support the Corps and their work, our labs. Uh, the other uh, sort of uh, end of the business. Uh, General Funk's team also had uh, plans that they built in the spring uh, to implement a thing called talent-based branching. In the old days, we had done an order of meritless branching system where uh, cadets at West Point and ROTC uh, could pick their branch sort of in the sequence in which they were going to graduate. Uh, number one cadet got first choice, uh, the last cadet got last choice. That wasn't a super way to match talent to our branches. Uh, our branches actually identify about 20 different attributes they look for in a new officer. It could be everything from uh, sort of prudent risk-taking if you're a pilot or EOD, on to communication skills, which is sort of a ubiquitous talent all our branches want. Uh, they surveyed our uh, cadets at West Point and Cadet Command to identify their talents. The branches built storyboards to talk about what talents they were interested in. And they turned to a tool called uh, HireView, a virtual interviewing tool, that General Funk, General Martin, and the commandants at TRADOC are using to reach out to 270 campuses, talk to cadets, so we can uh, get more diverse populations into those branches that sort of align closely with uh, top management in the Army. About 60% of our generals come from 25% of our branches. The main effort of this is to interest folks uh, of all stripes, all backgrounds, into those uh, key branches, infantry, armor, artillery, uh, air defense, and so forth. And General Funk and his team have done a great job of doing that, as has General Williams. And we're seeing those results come in now. West Point is uh, just now implementing their second round of, of this talent-based branching. Cadet Command will be implementing their first round. And the results that we see so far are very, very encouraging. So COVID didn't stop these great leaders for a moment. Uh, they accelerated our access to talent. Uh, they accelerated our ability to identify talent and get talent in the right place, right time, in the right part of the Army to do their best work. 
thanks to all three of you. Those are great, uh, great feedback for the audience. It's, uh, it's an encouraging sign as we move through these times and how quick we've been able to overcome. So thank you for that. Let me address the next uh, question here to, up to uh, to General Williams and and then anybody else that wants to add on this as well, because it is important about accession into the Army as we build the force. So is there some specific programs or initiatives that you'd like to highlight from the West Point view? And they may apply across a, a larger scope of the Army as well, in, uh, particularly in light of recent events and how, we, how we're addressing diversity and inclusion. Over to General Williams, please. Well, thanks, sir. Just to piggyback a little bit on what Dr. Wardensky said. So we also move through this, it's still are moving through this process in terms of acquiring the best talent. And this is about matching talent. And I think the tools that Dr. Wardensky talked about, as well as General Ford, allowed us to do And so now, once you enjoy this past year, uh, the most of this class in the history of the academy, we've been here you know, two, and this is the most diverse class that we just brought that in the class of uh, 2024. So then the question becomes, how do you take care of that talent? Uh, diversity is what we are. It's, inclusion is about how you leverage it. Right? How do you leverage that diversity you're bringing in? It to be all they can be while well they're here, to go on into the Army. Uh, a couple of programs that I'd like to highlight. just enjoyed our fourth honorable living group, focus on some of the conversations. Secretary talked about strategic level, we need to listen, learn and act. We're doing that here. We're doing a lot of listening. Uh, this past summer, things kind of hit a high water mark in terms of what's going on outside the walls. Of this. We set aside space and time for our young men and women to engage with, uh, academic professors, coaches, they're great tactical officers, and, and most importantly, they're not coaching officers to have these tough conversations. So we've set aside time in a cadet's day, cadet summer, that uh, we just sort of manifest highlighter of what Mark was last two weeks ago. We did the honorable living day. We brought the whole court down, and we had conversations at the squad level, built that small unit. Uh, this is my squad constructs where cadets can actually spend the time and talk to each other about what's going on in terms of racism and assault and sexual harassment. That's a part of our program that we do. The other thing is I've got character. We have a character uh, integration time which advised me at the strategic level here. Uh, we brought it out from and out of the classroom. Now I have the uh, uh, in the past that make character first and foremost. We've had it all the way through our code, but now the things that we do from a very practical standpoint, whether it be relational character, um, with the things that we do in our audit program, you now at a level is my intention. So those would be two things, sir, to answer the question. Thank you. Hey, hey Daryl, I'd also like to highlight the fact that uh, based on what Daryl just talked about, we also have the ability we have to retain the talent that we brought in. So we assess it in, and then we have to retain it. That's also part of the Army people strategy. And our culture has to be focused around mentorship and uh, um, opportunities. So as we work our way through that, piece, I think what we need to understand is that uh, we have to build a series of mentorship programs that allow us to see the potential in each and every one of the individuals and then also give them the opportunity to serve in places or uh, in uh, positions that uh, while they'll be maybe a bit uncomfortable, they'll actually learn and grow from that. So I can't overstress the importance of uh, mentorship and uh, providing opportunity to retain the talent that, we have, that we've acquired. That's the mission, too, in the Army people's You know, to uh, amplify uh, what uh, General Williams was talking about as well, uh, in terms of diversity and building uh, diverse teams, it's worth noting that in uh, 2019, we graduated a class uh, that was very diverse, uh, over 20% female. Um, and uh, when those uh, young ladies had gone to West Point, when they first applied, 
uh, certain branches were close to them. Infantry, armor, field artillery were not branches they could have picked uh, when they first applied to go to West Point. By the time they were graduating in uh, April of 2016, the Army had opened up those three branches to women. And today, thanks to the work of leaders like uh, General Williams, his team, General Funk and his team, uh, that's uh, now the case is we've got women in all of our branches and they're doing very well. I think we've got about 75 uh, ladies who have graduated from Ranger School. Uh, and so in very short order, uh, in the span of a cadet experience, we've gone from uh, no diversity in terms of gender in certain branches to now gender integration in those branches. Uh, we're making similar efforts uh, with regard to race and ethnicity uh, to make sure all our branches are welcoming places, uh, places feel like they can go and succeed and have a, a great opportunity to, li to apply their talents in support of their country. So uh, just terrific success and terrific progress ongoing. Super, thank you very much. Uh, any additional comments? Did someone try to, someone, I thought I heard someone try to add something. Yeah, I have a couple things to add from the civilian side, uh, especially regarding acquire and retention. The Army continues to champion change that will enable a more diverse workforce. So, for example, we're standardizing position descriptions to remove that very narrow language that would restrict qualified applicants. And more recently, the 1102 series, which are contract officers, that qualification standard changed to remove some of the restrictive language regarding certain business courses. So that occupation will now also be open to a more diverse qualified workforce. In terms of retention, it goes back to what I talked about in those career broadening opportunities and giving our careerists an, a chance to do different types of work at perhaps a higher grade level. That gets at retention. We have a lot of talented civilians who want to contribute, who want to do difficult work and maybe in a different occupation. And with ACMA and the Army People Strategy, we now have a deliberate process that allows for that. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Uh, what I'd like to do, since we only have just a few minutes left here, if I'd like to pull a quick uh, audible here and just uh, give the panel any opportunity, starting with Dr. Wozinski, sir, if you'd like to. Is there any overarching theme that you haven't covered or significant piece that, uh, that you want to get that word out? And then we'll just go around the panel quickly in the remaining five minutes, if we could. Sure. Um, I'd say that the, the overarching piece is that uh, the Army is – uh, got a long history of working uh, forward in diverse er in building diverse teams, and uh, that effort is uh, greatly vitalized today. Um, it was a strong effort already as of last summer's signing of the Army People Strategy. We had projects in uh, in flow, which people are now seeing. One would be ex example would be the uh, removal of photos from selection boards. Uh, that was a two-year effort that culminated this summer with a decision by the Secretary in Chief. Uh, so some of these uh, projects take a little bit of time, uh, some take less, uh, but they all revolve around some key ideas. And those ideas are uh, what we do ought to be sort of organic. It ought to feel like it fits within our organization. And those things are probably going to be based on our culture. Uh, and in our case of uh, building diverse teams, it is based on our culture. And, and the work General Funk is doing at, Cadet, at um, Cadet Command and in TRADOC in building strong culture, the work General Williams is uh, doing to build strong culture. Uh, the work uh, Carol does at the outset to bring in folks who align with our culture. And uh, it's a culture of service. It's one of uh, valuing human dignity, of operating from a level playing field, of having opportunity to pursue your, um, your talents to the maximum extent you can serve. And then uh, one in which we identify barriers that may be preventing folks from doing that. Uh, and these barriers, uh, when we find them, typically they arise because of changes we've made in the Army, many of which are technological. Uh, we didn't have the ability to do talent management in the old days. We didn't have the IT to do that. Uh, so we had to look at big aggregates, gender, uh, ethnicity, race, branch, grade, uh, civilian, military, active, guard, reserve. Uh, we're able to look well beyond those today because IT lets us get into these very deep talents people bring to the table. Uh, 20 at commissioning for officers, over uh, 190 by the time uh, they're a captain. Um, and, and so all this is based on uh, elevating the individual, uh, allowing them to pursue their, their talents, and do so within an, an, an institution that is vital to our country, 
but one in which we're constantly reviewing to make sure we don't have artifacts left over from old technologies, old practices that create barriers. And uh, we're very serious about doing this. The secretary's mark set the stage. And I think from each of these leaders, you can see how each of them is motivated to do this. Thank you very much, sir. General Funk, any closing comments? Yeah, I would, uh, thanks, uh, thanks again, and it's great to be part of this panel. I'd say our focus is on our culture uh, needs to develop diverse, inclusive, cohesive teams that fight and win our nation's wars. That's what ultimately our program is. That's what we're supposed to do. And the culture of winning matters. So uh, that's how I'll sum that up. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Beach, sir. Sir, uh, thank you so much. I, uh, just to echo what uh, Dr. Wardinsky um, uh, stated earlier, for us at the United States Army, diversity really is a framework uh, for people readiness and talent optimization. Um, what we are aiming really to do is to transition the conversation from diversity as a visual construct to that of a, of a value construct. We know that when we talk to a financial planner and we get the advice to diversify your portfolio, we get that immediately. And we want to have that same kind of resonance in the United States Army when we talk about diversity so people know that diversity really is a value driver and not just uh, those kind of uh, visual constructs that um, people normally think about diversity as. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Burton, ma'am. Uh, in the interest of time, I will be brief. But if you remember only one thing from my remarks, I would say remember the sentence because it is our overarching principle, and that is people are our greatest asset and diversity is our strength. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And General Williams, sir. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. Uh, General Funk said that the key to fighting and winning the multi-domain operation for our cohesive team. Uh, a big part of building toys of team uh, character. And we think that uh, we have a saying here that we've been working on here lately. We think we can catch character from those around us. We can teach or be taught to understand and practice it theoretically and intentionally develop our character through thought off and it. Character is caught and sod. Character is the key. Winning character is the key to the teams and how we're going to win and dominate tomorrow's battlefield. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Well, let me tip my uh, thanks to the panel as we close out, and, uh, and a thanks to our uh, virtual audience here. I'm sure there's a loud round of applause going off that you probably can't hear right now, but it's all going off. I believe it's a great panel, uh, succinct points, and, uh, and it really shows the emphasis the Army has on diversity and inclusion, and certainly the time is now, and I think this panel demonstrates that. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today, and the panel members, thank you once again for a wonderful panel. Everybody enjoy. Thank you very much. Be safe.